Hello! Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lunarverse. I'm your host, Dr. Charles Liu, and in the spirit of the holiday, please call me Chuck. What <laughs> holiday are we talking about? Of course, Halloween. Yes, this is a special Halloween episode, and it's such a pleasure for me, as always, to introduce my co-host, Alan Liu. Hey, Alan. Hello. Yes, printed out any really cool headgear lately? That's a mm. trick question. <laughs> <laughs> any of you watching on the YouTube, um, for those of you who aren't as well, um, I have a 3D printed Elrond crown on my head right now. Yes, so, yes. Uh, the uh, Good Lord job. of Rivendell. <laughs> ah, yes. J.R.R. Tolkien's classic about all those kinds of cool things. And because Halloween is fundamentally cultural, religious, and we need someone to bring that in. We have our resident expert on religious studies and the classics, Hannah Lou. Hi, Hannah. Hello. I'm excited to be back. And I, I did know. not 3D print my headband. Oh, <laughs> but I still like it. It works perfectly. Uh, uh, we have, again, saturated the Lunarverse with three Lou's. Perhaps we can have even more <laughs> next time. But it is a real pleasure to have everybody today. And there is a perfect cosmically cool thing of the day that is so joyful and that is completely relevant today because it has to do with how we humans sort of knitted what was out in space and in the sky with what was supernatural or what was unknown in our own societies, right? So yeah. Alan, today's joyfully cosmic cool thing of the day is the comet. Yeah, so it's Comet Tsushinshan Atlas C2023A3, I believe is the numerical designation for it. That's a really easy name to remember. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> 2023, the year it's discovered A3, because it was discovered in like the first part of the year, so that goes like A1, A2, A3, all the way down. Yeah, so this comet uh, is has been visible through uh, late September and October. Um, if you're hearing this around Halloween time, it's probably a telescope object at this point, but it has been a naked eye object uh, for some of its orbit around the sun this time. Uh, the right. trick with it is that it is a Oort cloud comet, people think. So it's from yes. that farthest out region of the solar system where there's a bunch of really small icy things orbiting the sun on these really, really long orbits. Um, this is potentially the first time that it's made it into the inner solar system and it may be kicked out of the solar system entirely after this because of the gravity of the planets just knocking it back out into interstellar space it's marvelous and and i gotta tell you alan the the fact that it's an Oort cloud comet is really remarkable to me do you know how and why we were able to know that just because of the uh, incredible strangeness of its orbit is that what happened yeah i think the idea is that if you sort of extrapolate where or extrapolate backwards where it must have come from gravitationally speaking um you can see that it goes farther out even than you know pluto and the rest of the kuiper belt objects which is the other big region that comets come from yeah um, and so the Oort cloud for for our audience is almost halfway out to alpha centauri i yeah, mean it is yeah, a the edge huge, of the Oort cloud is like huge space entire light year away and yet it's right. still gravitationally dominated by the sun because the stars are so far apart there's nothing else to knock them around one sort of historical nice note about this is that so this comet was visible in the morning hours and then it sort of swung between us and the sun and now is visible in the evening hours later. Um, so the first comet that sort of people had uh, interpretations of its orbit, I think, was the Great Comet of 1680, I believe, one of those years in, in that era, soon after uh, Newton had begun working on uh, his theory of gravitation. Um these people saw a comet on one side of the sun and then on the and then on the other side of the sun and some astronomers were starting to think hey maybe this is actually the same comet you know they didn't know whether comets were an atmospheric phenomenon or a planetary scale phenomenon like we know them to be now um, and they were just starting to figure out these sort of laws of physics and that idea of a comet you see on one side of the sky and then the other side of the sky was one of the big reasons that people were able to sort of deduce that these laws of physics that Newton was working out actually had some validity to them. Yeah, yeah. I will get to that in a moment because it is cosmically cool for those reasons. And there is a famous comet, of course, that helped bridge that gap yes. to explain comets <laughs> and orbits and so forth, to be to be described a little bit later. Uh, but Hannah, comets, how frightening were they? How amazing were they? How did our early ancestors think comets manifested themselves and to do what into our societies and our lives 
Yeah, uh, well, frightening probably isn't the word that I would use. I, oh. I think there was some, maybe some existential fear of like, there's a thing and we don't know what that is. And it looks pretty weird compared to normal stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it certainly wasn't as scary broadly as like an eclipse, right? Where the sun goes away and you're like, yeah. ah, is it coming back? I don't know. Uh, the comet <laughs> isn't really going to probably do that. Um, and I think ancient people knew that. But it yeah. certainly used comets to predict events or respond to events that perhaps were a little bit frightening. Certainly mm-hmm. awe-inspiring. There's a big sign from above. Something is weird in the sky. And that has mm-hmm. to mean something. Maybe mm-hmm. the king is going to die. Maybe the crops are going to flourish, right? Who knows? Yeah. Okay. So it was ambiguous, just weird. Yeah. Okay. I think... Yeah, awesome is maybe right. the word I would use. It, it like true sense of awesome. It inspires awesome, people, but, but yeah. definitely ambiguous. And also, people historically have used the appearance of co- of comets in the ways that they want, right? Mm, yeah. If I'm the king, I might say, "Ah, oh, this comet signifies that the gods love me," right? Yeah. <laughs> but if I am the one who wants to protect, who wants to be the king. I might say, ah, the comet signifies the gods hate the king. Ah, oh. yes. <laughs> well, wait, doesn't that, that reminds me, isn't it true that there is a comet in the Bayou tapestries that describe William the Conqueror coming into England back in the 1066-ish kind of time? Mm. Yes, that is I believe that too is. modern for me. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I believe I can. Yeah, we can probably put a picture of it because that's probably public domain at this point. Um, wow. But yeah, <laughs> stuff wow. from the 1060s, probably public domain. <laughs> right. Well, um, the impetus for doing this Halloween episode, aside from the fact that it's Halloween, yeah. uh, came from, as you two know, the fact that I recently had a book out called The Handy Quantum Physics Answer Book. Yeah. Right? And uh, it was way, uh, I, I had fun with it. It's a wonderful book. Uh, it came out during the summer. And what happened was a lot of people uh, wound up asking questions of me in interviews about the book regarding things that were mysterious. Uh, mm, things yeah. might even call like paranormal. Uh, I was asked about everything from superpowers and superheroes and so forth to things like ghosts and and mysterious uh, what we might think of telepathic or telekinetic activities, just what we, we broadly classify as paranormal, but just things that aren't usually seen in our regular uh, scientific existences. And mm-hmm. I was asked, uh, does quantum physics explain these things? That's actually surprising to me because, you know, for me, no, quantum physics, I'm not a quantum theorist uh, as my research specialty, but I use quantum physics in my regular daily research life all the time, or even my regular life, right? I mean, the part of the reason we're able right now to be talking to one another over the internet is because yeah. we have some small sense of how quantum physics works with electrons and photons and information and things like that. But it made me think that, you know what, there is a lot about the mysteries of science that links up with these superstitions of the past that have led us to create these um, historical or cultural kind of phenomena, right? And so why not devote a cool episode on some of those things and, and talk about how the history of these semi-religious unknown things led us to go toward the unknown in a different way with different steps and led us to mm-hmm. science, right? Yeah. So, so Hannah, uh, as the ancient meister, what is the history <laughs> of Halloween? Now, well, now wait, wait. Now, your is not ancient, right? You are young. Uh, I am the ancient. <laughs> oh, <one> thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you guys are the young ones, and you always will be, like in my mind. But um, uh, yes, uh, as the specialty uh, person here, knowing the ancient stuff, what's the origin of Halloween as we know it today? I was going to say, I, I like the Ancient Meister title. That's pretty cool. Ooh, okay. Right. <laughs> Although ancient I am Meister not ancient. That is true. Thank you. Thank you. That's fair. <laughs> uh, well, the history of Halloween uh, goes way, way back, uh, although it wasn't called that until much mm. more recently. Um, originally, Halloween was, well comes from a holiday called Samhain, which is a sort of Gaelic, Irish, Scottish, uh, ancient uh, 
uh, festival that would happen between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice. So actually, like maybe kind of right in the middle. Oh, mm, like yeah. a harvest festival or like, like a-, a harvest festival. Yeah, it could have been. It's a little unclear the origins of the date. So it could have been a harvest festival. That seems pretty likely uh, given this is harvest season, um, certainly. <laughs> yeah, in Europe at the very <laughs> Cer- least. Certainly in Europe, yeah. <laughs> uh, it also is the season when uh, shepherds would move their flocks from their mm. summer fields to their winter grazing fields, mm-hmm. and then perhaps also do some slaughtering as well. So it could have been also motivated by that harvest adjacent oh, event. So animal harvest as well as yeah. plant harvest. And that's yeah. where you get all those, you know, bloody, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Things like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like I said, I, I want to tell everybody uh, who's in the audience, we're not going to get into any really gross, scary, like horrible stuff. We're going to stick with the humorous, mythical, fun stuff, because that's kind of where we're headed sort of in the cosmic direction. So don't do Don't worry about that. We're going to actually talk about any real yeah. axe murderers or anything like that. We might have uh, a couple <laughs> historical analogies like we just did, but nothing. Yeah, there, there are some historical analogies that do happen. For example, the Salem witch trials. Yeah, we might get right? to those at some now, point. Yeah, Salem didn't happen during Halloween specifically, right? Oh, it lasted much longer than that. Yeah, but what happened was, of course, with Hannah, uh, your expertise on Salem uh, is significant. So you have to really tell us about that, (laughs) even though that's well, well later than your ancient Meister expertise. True, much past the Bayou Tapestry, I would say. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. (laughs) So Salem is today, of course, celebrated as like the Halloween capital of America because of this sort of very depressing yeah. thing that happened in the pre-colonial times or the colonial yeah, times. The, right? the colonial era uh, times, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But those kinds of um, behaviors happened a lot in those olden days. They just weren't as publicized as this particular Salem witch trials thing, right? Um now, I think that's a modern thing, although there may be more. Um, remember the Crucible, uh, Arthur Miller's play that actually, crucible. yeah, emphasized yeah. that. Um, okay, so as the lover of the Crucible, Hannah, <laughs> tell us about how, like that Salem witch trial thing, and goes into a- an attempt, literally to be scientific and figure out what happened, but then everything going totally wrong and being completely unscientific. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I think the science that you're referring to is the sort of investigations that occurred, right? So to give the listeners a little bit of background, perhaps the, the Salem witch trials are a 17th century phenomenon in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, which today, as you mentioned, is a, you know, uh, a Halloween fun town land uh, during the entire month of October. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is, the traffic is wild. There's a sign on the highway that says, no parking in Salem. Wow. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> um, but uh, was the site of these, uh, maybe at the time, what might have been considered demon possessions or or witchcraft or deals with the devil that caused young women for the most part and some other folks as well to have what maybe sort of like epileptic seizures or convulsions or or urges to to dance or to sing or uh anything the puritans these, didn't like <laughs> anything the puritans didn't like <laughs> Puritans didn't like a whole lot of things. Yeah, they, they were sure very didn't. Puritan, you know. <laughs> if I may say, it seems to me they also really didn't like young women. Um, mm. Yeah, <laughs> but seems legit. Um, what would happen is that the 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 people in charge of the village, so usually men who were ordained uh, priests um, or reverends, would conduct these investigations to figure out, well, what is going on here. I would say in some ways that is scientific because you're asking a question and trying to find an answer and maybe you're doing some looking into the facts and trying to figure out, you know, did this person in fact have this strange attack? Uh, But they did also go into it in a less than scientific way because Mm -hmm. they already had a preconceived notion of what was causing these um, 
sort of hysterical events, uh, mm. for lack of a better word. So mm. they would say, ah, well, our investigation is to find out who is is doing these things. And then once Ooh. we find them, we know it's a deal with the devil. And then we'll wow. uh, kill them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So definitely unscientific in our modern sense of science, but an investigative strategy nonetheless. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It, it's a lot of, you know, motivated reasoning isn't isn't outside of people's minds these days it's just that it's it's less often as dramatic i guess there's there's still you know various situations where there are show trials and likes things like that um but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i i think sort of the what makes salem very interesting is that there were in fact witch trials you know in across europe uh for a very long time uh for you know centuries uh by the time that salem happened but salem was sort of the biggest time it happened in like the modern united states Mm. Um, and so because that's where we're, we are and that's the culture that we're in, that's the one we know about. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's answer a couple of questions. Um, they're just questions that are kind of hanging in the air that we should pick up since we happen to be here right now. So uh, give us a question. All right. Well, here's a question. Uh, yeah. So we for, for our Halloween episode, we're just coming up with questions and answering them. So we're just, <laughs> we don't have any specific sources, but we've, we picked them up from the milieu, plucked them out of the okay. aether, perhaps. <laughs> so this the first aether, one... not the ether. Oh Ooh, my goodness! Maybe. Interesting. It's, it's yeah. that elven pronunciation there. Yes, exactly. About. Yes. Maybe All right. So here's provided by the ace she, which are the, the <laughs> fairies of the fairies of Samhain. Oh, there you oh go. Oh my gosh! Which, <laughs> Even... fun fact, I have no confirmation for this, so maybe it's not a fact, but tis the season. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So an alternative spelling for the Ace She, which are these uh, sort of like old Irish fairies, is basically mm -hmm. the same spelling as the Aes Sedai in Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. And I feel like maybe Whoa. he got that from there. That That's all I'm saying. seems plausible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. We so here's our, our fairy question. Um, do full <laughs> moons affect behavior? Ooh. Oh. Do full moons affect behavior? Well, of course, uh, werewolves, right? Uh. <laughs> yes, werewolves, of course. Yes. Well, I mean, like, of course. If we're talking about about non-human or semi-human creatures like werewolves, you can imagine, like, you know, sea turtles, right? When they hatch, they tr sort of follow the moonlight, and you know, moths follow the moon, uh, mm, supposedly to figure out where they're yes, going. Yes, they do. Well, it is true. I mean, when you have extra light floating around, mm -hmm. light-sensitive animals and plants will react to them, right? So that's actually true. Now. The issue of behavior, the human behavior and the complexity of human behavior, that's a little bit more complicated, right? Because uh, if you look at the full moon, say, any impact on human life other than the extra light it provides in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. it's negligible compared to any other time of the month, right? The moon's distance hasn't changed very much. There's more tides coming in one direction because the the way that the earth and the moon and the sun are lined up that also but, happens at new moon but, too right also happens at new moons when the when the moon is not visible at night so it doesn't matter uh, so there isn't anything different but i think that you could imagine that with human behavior being so complex and triggered by so many unusual things when the moon is up and full and it's very bright at midnight sometimes you can even see your own shadow Surely yeah. our moods must be affected. Our sleep cycles must be affected. And and if we feel like it, you know, we could make it a really fun thing to talk about. That's probably where the legends of the werewolves came from. I actually don't know. Does anybody uh, here know how werewolves were invented? I'd probably imagine they were like, you know, people were like scared about that. I'd, I'd heard of hypotheticals about like things like rabies and stuff, like diseases transmitted by animals like wolves. Uh. Um I know other things about the, the other thing that I want to point out about the moonlight is that we know that um, modern light pollution causes a lot of things where it messes up our sleep and that could mess you up and oh, make you overtired right. and therefore mm -hmm. act less rationally just because you're really sleepy. So mm. it's possible that the full moon could have some <laughs> direct light effects like that, but that's not going to be every full moon because sometimes it'll be cloudy or sometimes right. it'll be raining, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, the full moon has an effect on my life when I'm like, ooh, the moon is full. I want to go for a walk in the woods. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I imagine the moonlight is going to be the most significant effect of, okay. on human physiology. Oh, I think, right. I think okay. also a lot of this is, you know, the sort of pattern matching, right? When people see something 
weird that happens on the full moon, they'll attribute it to the full moon. And if they see something weird that happens on any other day, they'll say some other reason caused it, you know? Yeah, you know, that's true. So, you know, Hannah, you're off on your full moon walking, right? And then you hear something weird and you're like, I heard something weird, man. It must have been a werewolf. Whereas if you're walking in a new moon when it was dark and you hear something weird, you might be like, oh, I heard something weird. It must not have been a werewolf because it wasn't a full moon. It must have been a vampire or, you know. Right, right. uh, Exactly, exactly. I mean, this Uh is is a classic human behavior, not just noticing patterns, which is something that we do naturally, Mm -hmm. but also trying to fit in whatever's happening to your cultural context. If you've heard about werewolves before and something weird happens to you on your moonlight Mm -hmm. walk, You might be like, oh, that makes sense. It's a werewolf. Or like you're driving through the Pine Barrens in New Jersey in your pickup truck and something's behind you. You're like, oh, that's the Jersey (laughs) Devil, obviously. (laughs) Whereas if you were in Oregon, it'd be Bigfoot. So exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. I actually do have uh, an interesting fact for you about the origin of werewolves. Um, Oh, oh, talk to me. So I don't I don't know if this is the origin origin, but there's a story in Greek mythology of a guy named uh, Lucaon, uh, oh. where you might hear the word lichen in there, like wolf. Yes, lycanthrope. Yeah, yeah. In, like lycanthrope, uh, anthros, of course, meaning man. Uh, so uh, oh. a wolf man. Mm. That would be wolf Greek. man. <laughs> uh, that's, no, that's heavy. A different man. Guy. That's heavy. A different guy. Uh. Oh, that's uh, he was yeah, a, that's he was a king, um, Lycaon, who tried to trick Zeus uh, into eating human flesh, which Zeus doesn't like. Uh, contrary to popular belief, human sacrifice was not really a thing in ancient Greece. That's not he didn't do that. Uh, uh-huh. That was frowned upon, um, and so uh, Zeus turns him into a wolf. Oh, that's, that's uh, pretty fitting, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, how about that? Hey, yeah, that, and, that and works. That, that's where the word comes from. I don't know mm. if that's you know the original original myth, but it's a cool fact. Lycan cool. Andros, uh, Wolf Man. Yeah, that's great. You guys are too young to know about Wolf Man Jack, aren't you? <laughs> I yes. have heard of the name. Wolf Actually, Man you guys Jack. are probably too young to know about like disc jockeys in general, right? Because you put on your, heard of your disc streaming jockeys. stuff. Oh, I know what a disc <laughs> jockey is. Okay. Anyway, Wolfman Jack, you know, hey, heavy man, brother. Yeah. Anyway, uh, one of these days we want to talk about all those old classic DJs. They they really changed our society <laughs> in so many ways. And and many of them were late nights. Uh, part of the reason Wolfman Jack became famous was because he had the midnight shift all the time. And, and he yeah. was doing all So I didn't know stuff. that, but there's a character in a Dungeons and Dragons uh, stream that I like to listen to called Wolfman oh. Anne, who's a radio <laughs> There you go. Really? <laughs> yeah, it must be an homage. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, there you go. Wow. The old generation is informing the new. <laughs> yeah. oh. I think it's marvelous. That's yes, D and D. Well, D and D, as we all know, is very much built into the sort of mythologies that we hear about in Halloween, right? Yeah, we have werewolves, we have vampires, all the undead that we talk about, mm. right? Yeah. But um, I, I will uh, say the following about zombies, everybody, just so you know. And and this is a brief diversion. The our our editing staff may edit this out if you wish, but let me just say <laughs> that uh, our primary producer meister our grand poobah uh, who is himself pretty talented on numerous aspects of this technological futuristic thinking has told me before that the 21st century awesomeness in the paranormal and in like science fiction is going to be zombies and it already is to some extent right think about like the walking dead or uh, mm-hmm. all these other kinds of things um that have to do with life and afterlife and not life and things like that. Yeah. But uh, zombies have been around for a very long time, right? And mm. zombies are, of course, part of D&D, very much so. And they're very much a part of Halloween. Woo-hoo. And they're a big part of nature. Yes, I wanted to tell you all, zombie ant fungus, Ooh, right? The zombie. Very famous, right? Discovered. Oh, yeah. Um, where, and, and then... Actually, the parasitic wasps, uh, which you guys can all learn someday, um, the majority of wasps in this world are not the kind that build big nests that hang out with us, but rather they're Mm -hmm. a predatory 
and they will lay their eggs in prey that they have stunned and paralyzed and drag them into oh, a, no. like a nest. This is and the yes, grossest part of the episode so far. This is, yeah, this is it. When the <laughs> eggs hatch, the eggs, uh, the larva will actually eat the zombified uh, bug that was jabbed by and paralyzed and poisoned by the wasp. Uh, That's pretty distressing. It, that it is, is really distressing. Halloweeny. It's yeah, very yeah. Halloweeny. Uh-huh. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh! Uh, there is a well-known version uh, in the American desert. It's called the tarantula hawk. Ooh. It's a wasp that specifically uh, <laughs> seems to be able to get big spiders. Uh, yeah, so Dang, that's a little gross. Spiders with wasps in them. That's uh, that's pretty <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> That is kind of. nightmare. I don't know. Fuel. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why the horror movie people haven't made horror movies about parasitic wasps yet. They're all talking about the, the coming the out ant- of tarantulas. Get yeah, for sure. Here. The ant fungus, is, you know, has inspired things like The Last of Us or The Girl with All the Gifts. You know, those oh, are right. those are pretty pretty uh, directly nature inspired. But the parasitic right. wasps, I don't think, are uh, nearly as uh, as common in, in <laughs> Hollywood. <laughs> right, and and the the zombie ant fungus, of course, are. Um, they're insect pathogenic. Yeah. Right? In other words, they they can nail those poor ants and you know force them to go up and try to get uh, more sun, and then they, their bodies burst, and then the spores of the zombie yeah, ant Ophia fungus spread. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, that's yeah. the, the kind of ant fungus. <laughs> it's great stuff. But but we yeah, humans right. have not been affected except in fiction. Right. Yeah, uh, right. Um, there's an idea that because our brains are larger, warmer, and like more complicated, that it's a lot harder for funguses to take over our brains. So they just goodness. don't really bother. So, well, I like that. that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, the fact that the fact that our brains are more complicated, that a single uh, pathogen or a single drug or something like that would not turn us into mindless right. zombies. Yeah, it's quite a relief in in my mind. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right? I think it does make good. treating certain neurological disorders a lot harder. But oh, that's <laughs> it's probably true. good. Yeah, and the other idea is yes, that because we're warm blooded, uh, potentially our heat in our brain would mess up the fungus, so it wouldn't be able to survive both out in the mm. open air and in our minds. Oh, but but didn't I read recently that? the average human body temperature is dropping. Yeah, but I think if you got fungus and you'd probably have a fever and it would counteract that. <laughs> so, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> if you got probably fungus. still safe. <laughs> yeah. I feel much better. I feel much Yikes. better. Okay, all right. So I have a question for you, Hannah, because your headdress specifically is feline in nature, <laughs> right? Now we've talked about where wolves what about where cats i mean cats where of panthers? course <laughs> cats show up in halloween all the time right probably uh, yeah, the most the popular cats. animal the black cats which Along are the with familiars the of witches and things like that right so what's the nature of the cat as far as the history of all this good stuff is uh do you have any any insights on why we've picked certain animals to be uh which is familiars or uh, mythological stuff. Historically speaking, did the ancient Romans or the ancient Egyptians have particular uh, fondness for particular animals? You know, how does that lead us to where we got to go? Oh, so the black cat is an interesting, interesting animal. There's not actually like a ton of sort of historical associations with it being, um, uh, negative influence actually uh cats are great <laughs> cats yeah. are cats will kill the rats you know cats oh, yeah. will Keep protect your, your farms and your grain <laughs> exactly the ancient egyptians were way into cats um uh and and they have kind of evolved with with people uh short term right in the same way that kind of dogs have in this domesticated oh, animal yeah. kind of way yeah. okay. um okay. but there are some uh, traditions of cats have uh, being sort of witches familiars, uh, yes. or even like a animal that a that a witch could um, turn into could t- turn into exactly or possess in some the way. The first movie of the Harry Potter <laughs> series has uh, Maggie Smith, you know, right? yeah, uh, McGonagall yeah. turning yeah. from a cat into a person like right away. Yeah, um, yeah. When, when you guys saw it <laughs> for the awesome. first time, with did that did that make you happy when you saw that happening? Oh, it was totally cool. It was totally cool. It's great. 
the CGI was great because they don't show it the first time. They just show the shadow and you're like, oh, I guess we won't see it. But then they show it to you later. It's very cool. But wow. again, we have the witch and the cat, right? This is a known yeah. trope. Um, sometimes going back to those uh, ace she, those Irish fairies, they oh, yeah. they sometimes are um, associated with with cats. Um, they're just around. They're mostly helpful, but sometimes they're helpful to witches, and that's not great, I guess. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, although I witch is a good witch, unless the witch is true. a good witch. Yeah, that's true. Although I think there's a there's a um, Apollo. Apollo 13 connection to cats, maybe to a black cat. Um, Yeah, I guess, I guess the space transportation system 13 never existed because 13 is supposed to be an unlucky number. So so so, STS is the space shuttle's designation. Yeah. So the space transportation system refers to the space shuttle. Yeah. So they went from space shuttle uh 12 to space shuttle mission 14 uh, well because apollo guess. 13 did have that whole like 13 right? failure is not yeah. an option issue right where they had to did not bring the great. bring the capsule back and and it was almost mm-hmm. a disaster but they they brought everyone back um safely yeah. in the end so maybe they were like well we, we already had one 13 mess up in our space program we can't do another one <laughs> <laughs> yikes well apparently okay. the sts 13 made a mission patch with a black cat on it because to symbolize oh. their <laughs> oh. they're unlucky <laughs> but they were fine actually yeah uh, they okay. landed on friday the 13th and all was well wow mm-hmm. that makes me very happy yeah. Okay, good. All right, let's get a couple more questions in before we run out of time, and we can go about this all night uh, and until the moon is full and we can walk around in the dark, right? Um, yeah, uh, Hannah, is there a question that you have wanted to know, like uh, pull the the quantum world and the non quantum world together into some sort of fun mashup for Halloween? Well, I in my research for this episode, I came across the. Uh, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. The Great Galactic Ghoul. <laughs> yeah. And I would love to hear more about that. <laughs> the Great Galactic Ghoul was uh, funnily... Oh, yeah. Yeah. With, correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Alan, I know you've got uh, some historical about knowge this. about this. Funny. Yes. See, Mars has always been a great destination for us wanting to get there, right? Humans, uh, ever since speculations about people living on Mars and things like that, and then fiction like Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles and so on and so on. So we've sent, we as a species, humans, have sent a large number of probes to Mars. Yeah. But for almost the entire history of human space exploration, only the United States and NASA has ever successfully landed a spacecraft on Mars. Yeah, Mars you, probes. Yeah. Uh, it, and that was like a weird thing. Like, you would send, okay, the U.S. sent something. Yay, Viking, it landed. Woohoo. Well, the, <laughs> the Soviets sent something, it's gone. You know, the Japanese sent something, it's gone. The Chinese sent something, it's gone. It's like, oh, ho, NASA has landed <laughs> oh, the Pathfinder. Right. Now, NASA's, NASA's had its share of failures also. There was oh, yes. the one where we did the metric to imperial conversion oh, yes. wrong. We, we've had plenty oh, no. of failures. As, oh, yeah. That that wasn't the ghoul at oh, all. That no. was the, the great weenie mathematician who failed to convert units properly. It was it was, it was a subcontractor was the thing. It wasn't even like, mm, it was like course. someone had contracted out part of the program to a different company and they were like, oh, this number is clearly in feet per second, but it was actually in meters per second. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Mark your units, yeah. kids. Mark That's your units, right. exactly. Mark your units. <laughs> yeah, so the Great Galactic Ghoul, this is an idea where it's like, Mars has some sort of creature that eats space probes. Ooh. Mm. Munch, munch, gobble, 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 gobble. All right. Got it. I that, thought maybe that's... it was that guy's face. Remember when there was that <laughs> image of that dude's face on Mars? Yeah, it didn't even look oh, like a dude. It just face like a... on Mars. Yes. It was, it was like two dots in a line. It was like, it's a face. <laughs> well, this is a, that's a classic human react. That's called pareidolia. That's, it is, uh, oh. yes. That's when humans make faces and stuff. Like you ever look at the front of a car and you're like, "Oh, he's smiling." Like, yes, exactly. Yes. It's, it's pareidolia. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same. Oh. Also, Greek yeah. comes from the word uh, eidolon, which means like ghost. Actually, ooh, yeah, man, definitely very cool. Yeah. So in terms wow. of the Great Galactic Goal, either it, maybe it's full now because China finally got one uh, successful lander 
recently. Ah, okay. Mm. okay, so the great galactic ghoul is no longer hungry and therefore has given us the boon <laughs> of allowing us more awesomeness. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so we'll China has the China's uh, Tianwen, I think they call it. Um, it's a this the Mars rover. It's a lot like Spirit and Opportunity, the ones oh, that okay. flew in two thousand four. So that one's All been right. driving around, and good, then there have been good, some good, orbiters good. from other countries as well. So okay, yeah. So the Great Galactic Ghoul will no longer haunt us. Uh, one hopes. Happily. One hopes. <laughs> we have one sated hopes. sated the ghoul uh, until yeah. next time, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. We, you know, we're we're really so running out of time, but we uh, haven't even talked about ghouls and ghosts and and things like that. Uh, let me close with spooky action at a distance. Ooh, spooky I, action at a distance. Yeah, mm. I, I just have to talk about that because that uh, links us most closely to uh, physics and, yes. and the universe and I, you know, quantum stuff before. Uh, basically, spooky action at a distance was a term coined by Albert Einstein in trying to explain a phenomenon which we know today as quantum entanglement. Okay. He was mm. basically saying, you know what? According to the math of quantum physics, you could take an object and kind of tie it together as two particles and, and make them so closely tied that as if they were a single object that they could become uh, able to communicate with one another or one affects the other, mm -hmm. even if they are spread far apart. Okay, spooky action at a distance. Yeah, and, you could have one here and one on the moon and they would right. like instantly affect each other's quantum state. Right. Anyway, that's theoretically possible Ooh. as long as you maintain quantum coherence, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, as long as these two are communicating in a specific quantum way, then you could have action at a distance and it would never violate the laws of physics, even if it seemed like, for example, information was traveling faster than the speed of light. Okay. Yeah. So the funny thing about it is people always say the next obvious reaction is like, well, if we use that, can we use that for instant communication with, you know, a Mars probe or something like that? Whoa. Get around that is that what goal. I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the thing about it is there's a bunch of other like sort of annoying corollaries in quantum mechanics, which sort of basically say you can send quantum information, but somehow you can only send quantum information that contains no regular information with it. So you can't send like a normal message of like text, but you could say, oh, now we know that this quantum state has some properties that it didn't before, but you need additional regular information to actually decode those properties. So you have to send a normal light speed message in order to actually figure out what information you just sent by the quantum speeds. So that's mm. a little bit frustrating. Um, it's so close yeah. to being able to use crazy laws <laughs> of physics stuff. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, Einstein called it spooky action at distance because he didn't think it would be possible. But it yeah. was shown indeed to be possible uh, amongst other people by a guy named John Bell. Yeah. Uh, and a bunch of things called Bell's theorem came about. So, Hannah, I want to close our episode by asking you, as far as spooky action at a distance is concerned, right? Think uh, about your ancient ideas about spookiness and action and stuff <laughs> like that. Uh, what What can you tell us to to think about spookiness and action and distance. Oh, well, I mean, you're describing spooky action at a distance. All I could think is like, give me a piece of their hair and I'll make a love potion. Like this oh, is classic yeah. magic, right? This is classic. Yeah. If you have a little piece of something from something far away, you can make it do something. Wow. Uh, yeah. You know, this, I mean, this is like an old, old idea. It's so cool that it's also physics. Mm -hmm. It is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, it doesn't quite do the voodoo doll thing, I guess. Alas, so, um, <laughs> well, it would be yet. really nice not if it yet. did. Not yet, right? <laughs> well, you know, we <laughs> can we can control a robot somewhere else, but that's just like non spooky action at a distance. That's like unspooky right. action at a distance. That's right. <laughs> and and in the end, you know, the connection between magic and science is just a little tiny difference at the sufficiently complex levels. Uh, right, as Arthur's testability, T it's about you. right. Yeah, yeah, about can you test it? Can you falsify? Can you adjust it? As Arthur C. Clarke famously said, right? Uh, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah, so it's pretty that awesome. gives us 
all kinds of opportunities to talk about future stuff. Uh, yeah. We we really have run out of time, but what fun this has been. Everyone uh, in the audience, I hope that our Halloween-y kind of episode has been neither hollow nor weed. Yeah. I, <laughs> I have certainly had a good time. It has been a great pleasure to be with you all. Alan Liu, our co-host, as always, thank you so much. An awesome Elrond action there. Thank you. I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, and I'm not having to take the ring to Mount Doom myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And our excellent guest today, Hannah Liu, with the awesome cat ear thingies. Thank you so much for being with us and happy Halloween. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy Halloween. All right. And for all of you in the audience, thank you for being with us today. If you like what you've seen and heard, please support us on Patreon. And as always, thank you for being a part of the Ludiverse. Mm -hmm.